Uh, welcome everybody. My name is Angela Fobbs and I'm a part of the Florida State team. Today's discussion will feature two experienced and committed Democrats running in a primary for governor, Florida Commissioner of Agriculture and Consumer Services, Nikki Freed, and the U.S. Representative, Charlie Crist. We want to thank both of you for taking time out of your busy campaign schedules to talk to us and thank everyone for joining us today. Please note that Democrats Abroad has not endorsed any candidate and is committed to remaining neutral for the duration of the primary. DA reached out to all candidates who filed in this election and we are pleased that Representative Christ and Commissioner Freed responded. Uh, you will hear questions from the caucuses who are also co-sponsoring this event and we thank them for participating. Uh, now, we'll hear from our international vice chair, Art Shankler. Art. Thank you, Angela. On uh, behalf of Democrats Abroad, I wanna thank all of you for joining us today and our Florida State team for putting in this event together. And I wanna especially thank our participants, Commissioner Nikki Freed and Congressman Charlie Crist. This is a recognition, recognition by them of the importance of the overseas vote. For those of you who aren't familiar with Democrats Abroad, it is the largest organization of American citizens outside of the US. It's also an official arm of the Democratic Party. Uh, we have representation on the Democratic National Committee and we send delegates to the National Convention. It's our mission to provide Americans abroad with a voice in our government and to help elect Democratic candidates by mobiliz mobilizing those the overseas vote. And as Angela said, we don't endorse candidates in the primary. We will certainly be working to get out the vote for who's ever elected, uh, who's ever nominated as the Democratic candidate. In 2020, votes from abroad were the margin of victory in the tightest of races, helping elect Joe Biden of both Arizona and Georgia, and helping Democrats win the White House and keep control of Congress. We're grateful for everyone who voted in 2020 in spite of numerous obstacles, including interruptions in international mail delivery from many countries. We must show up again in 2022 and find even more overseas voters than ever before. It's clear that our democracy depends on it. The registration deadline for Florida is quickly approaching. So if you haven't already done so, please go to www.votefromabroad.org. And I know someone's gonna put that in the chat box and request your ballot and encourage all of your overseas friends and family to do the same. You can send your form in by email to request a ballot and remember to ask for your ballot to be sent to you by email to avoid those post office delays. In 2020, there were over 190,000 military and overseas civilian registered to vote from Florida. I think making it the biggest, uh, biggest overseas population in, of any state in the country. We need to make sure those voters show up and we need to grow that base. After you've requested your own ballot, think about who else do you know? Who can, who can you help vote from abroad and who can you share today's recording with to ensure they vote this year? I'm very much looking forward to this discussion with our candidates. I think I saw a question about who their favorite Disney World character is. So I'm looking forward to the answers to that and other questions. With that, I will hand the floor back to Angela. Angela? Thank you, Art. Um, next, I'd like to introduce uh, Amy Porter, a Florida voter and a member of our Florida State team. She's also the communications office for DA France. Amy will introduce our first candidate, Commissioner Nikki Freed. Amy. Hi, everyone. Amy Porter in Paris, France. It's my pleasure to introduce Nikki Freed, our current Commissioner of Agriculture and the only Democrat to win statewide in Florida since 2012. A former public defender, Nikki is a longtime advocate for criminal justice reform and the legalization of marijuana. As the only Democrat in Florida's cabinet, Nikki has been our voice in Tallahassee, standing up for our rights and for democracy. She kicked the NRA out of weapons license permitting, legalized hemp for farmers, protected our environment and actively defends voting rights and a woman's right to choose. I will now turn it over to Nikki Freed, who can tell us what her leadership would mean to our state after two decades of Republican administrations. 
Well, first of all, thank you so much and good well, good afternoon for me. And I think I heard good evening to, to a lot of you uh, for our Democrats abroad. I'm so really pleased to be with you here today. And I just wanna say thank you. Um, you and I all know how close uh, my election was in 2018. Uh, in fact, during the entire recount, I continuously was contacting um, the executive director of the Democratic Party, kept asking how many more overseas ballots. It was a continuous uh, question I had every single day. How many more ballots are out there? Are they going to be Democratic ballots? And you know, I was rest assured that the work that was done by the Democratic Party of Florida um, to make sure that we were getting those ballots back, that we were communicating with our uh, citizens overseas was was vital part of the program in 2018. Um, and I won by such a small margin, 6,753 votes. Um, and I know that you had a tremendous part to play in that. So thank you for being involved, even when you are, are so far away. And thank you for caring about the future of, of your state, um, even when you're outside of the American borders. You know, a little background about me. I was born and raised in Miami. Uh, my parents um, and I are from the Jewish faith. And what I was taught growing up is what we call tikkun olam, to heal the world. Um, this is part of every aspect of what I do in life. Um, and that's everything to making sure that we are standing up against injustice and seeing the rise of anti-Semitism and seeing the rise of racism and hate crimes um, across our state and our nation to stand up and fight against that, to ensuring that everyone has access to the ballot box and including those of you that, that are overseas. Um, again, I understand by, by every vote matters and to make sure that every vote is counted. Um, our civil rights, as we know, are on the chopping block and is on the ballot in 2018. And so many individuals have fought, bled, and died for, for, the, for the very rights that are under attack right now. So when I'm governor, these attacks stop. I will always stand on the side of expanding our civil rights, not limiting them, expanding our access to the ballot box, not limiting them. Floridians right now that are living here in our state have seen so many challenges um, and not having somebody in the governor's office to lift up those issues and try to solve them. So when I'm governor, I will declare on day one, a housing state of emergency here in our state because that's what it is, it's an emergency. We have to expand Medicaid. I will expand access to the ballot boxes. I will give seniors a $1 billion rebate and implement same day voter registration. Even from where you are, I ask you to stay engaged in this fight with me. Remember, we are fighting the accumulation of four Republican governors in a row. That's Jeb, that's Charlie, that's Rick, and then that's Ron. 14 speakers of the House in a row, 13 Senate presidents, completely one party control of our state in the most important offices that control every aspect of it. After a generation of Republican rule, Florida's thriving economy has been disconnected from the individuals it is meant to serve. This year, Florida alone has ranked the 11th worst state to raise a family. Our poverty rate is way too high, particularly for our children. Our rankings for working class people and healthcare are consistently on the bottom of the spectrum. This is why I want to lower our costs while also improving our standards of living. We can not afford to lose this race, but I know that we can do this. Why? Because I also know that Floridians, whether you're living here in, in Florida or you're overseas, believe in that same philosophy, in that same principle of Takun alum. We may call it a little bit different um, depending on who we are and where we are from, but Floridians know what is right and wrong. We have to take back our government. So I'm asking you to join me, to try something new and to make history by electing the first female governor of our state. And with your help, I know that we can do this. So thank you. And I'm looking forward to this conversation. Thank you so much, Commissioner Freed. Um, we'll have a few, a couple of questions from our caucuses. Our first question will be from the senior caucus, caucus uh, Jim Dobson. Jim? Yes, thank you. And first, let me say uh, uh, thank you, Commissioner Freed, for being here and speaking to us. And secondly, uh, thank you for all the work you've done and all the fights you've fought already uh, in Florida. I, I'm former, uh, I'm a graduate of Florida State, still have a lot of friends in Florida and follow your politics. And I know you've been fighting an uphill battle. I, we all appreciate it. Thank you. Uh, my question for you is, uh, can you tell us about the Senior Bill of Rights that you hope to implement 
And secondarily, would, do you think it would be possible to, uh, to implement a senior bill of rights nationwide? And if so, or in both cases, uh, do you think that would have any effect or any consequences for Americans living abroad? Well, and thank you. And even though I'm a Gator, uh, my, my, dad, <laughs> my dad went to Florida State, so I grew up I, as a Seminole. <laughs> but didn't you? Yeah, okay. But you, you've lived in Tallahassee for some time. so Yeah, for, for three and a half years now. But yeah, so I, I grew up as I grew up doing this and then I, I started <laughs> yeah. doing this. Um, so, but I, I, I appreciate the, the, the question. You know, look, Florida has the second most senior per capita in, in the country. Um, our senior population is a gift to be treasured and to be treated with, with reverence and, and respect. Uh, we have a sacred duty to honor and, and to care for our seniors. They're literally the ones who, who built our state. Um, our seniors have lived the experiences of our diverse workforce. Um, they volunteered at home and then volunteered abroad. Um, our seniors mentor young people. Our seniors have, again, built the state of Florida. Um, that's why when, when I'm governor, um, I'm going to implement a senior's bill of rights. And, and where some of these ideas even came from, when I first declared to run, we, we toured the whole state and we had the, these listening session tours and hearing from so many of our seniors or what the issues were on the ground. And even talking to my grandmother, who is uh, 92 years old, I always would call her and be like, oh, grandma, you're the, you're the oldest person I know. And she's like, hey, yeah, I'm the oldest person I know. <laughs> and, and, uh, and so I, I ask her, you know, she is, you know, my, my grandfather fought in World War II. She's seen the Great Depression. She's seen wars. You know, and so I always try to make sure that, that I always have a pulse on what she's talking about, what her friends are talking about. And so what our Seniors Bill of Rights would do um, one is improving transportation options um, with an eye towards the, those needs of our seniors, knowing that so many of our seniors may not have family members, you know, that can drive them places. And, and so much times I'm hearing these, they're, they're literally dying at home because they can't be mobile. Um, we need to be establishing a long-term um, abundsman. Um, the stories that I'm hearing across our state are just so gut-wrenching that we are having our seniors, whether it's in nursing facilities or it's in long-term care or short-term care, and, and there's nobody to call to complain about, you know, what's happening inside of these, these nursing homes. And people are, are scared to fall because they're scared to end up in the hospital. And so making sure that we've got somebody that is an entire team that is taking these phone calls um, and that are going out and actually being very proactive. Um, also lowering prescription drugs um, and ensuring that they stay low. Uh, we're hearing this across, again, the state, and this is certainly it will be something that, you know, working on across the abroad, is that the, every month it, it's changing on, on medications and the cost of medications and what is being provided. Um, and we have to also make sure that we're ensuring that the Medicaid expansion meets the needs of those that are living in our system living facilities and our senior population. And yes, I can believe I believe that this model can be implemented um, nationwide. And I will also implement a one billion dollar senior rebate. Um, during COVID nineteen, the pandemic took a considerable toll on our Florida seniors. Always have been. Um, just really just extraordinary an, an inability to, to really reach out and and were harmed so much by by not being around family and not being around friends and today few are bearing you know are bearing the brunt of this current economic crisis than our Florida seniors uh, this rebate is a one-time grant um, not a loan and it will be through the Florida Department of Elders Affair uh, will be made available to citizens over the age of 65. And that would obviously go to not just those that are that they're Florida residents, but obviously those of you who are living abroad, but have residents still in Florida, that would also go as well to those that are abroad. Um, and I will devote those resources to the community care programs and home-based service programs, um, cutting those wait times for unnecessary services. No one should ever have to wait for a hot meal to be delivered, a uh, home health aid, personal care items. Uh, and of course, we've got to expand Medicaid. Um, we must help our, our early seniors who have not yet reached Medicare age yet, um, but are out of work or work for employers who have no health coverage. And all of these issues that while, you know, some of them are hands on of what's in, in our state, but the same thing for, for hearing what's happening over abroad and what's happening in our seniors communities over there to make sure that that same, you know, bill of rights um, extends to those across uh, the seas, um, but also making sure that we're looking at ways to expand this across the country. Great. Well, thank you so much. Okay, our next question 
will be from our Global Women's Caucus, Sally Swartz. Uh, Sally, do you want to unmute? I've already done it. Okay. Thank you. And hello, Miss Candidate. Um, I am in charge for the Global Women's Caucus of Reproductive Justice, our action team. And I'm sure that you know that the Florida 15 week ban on abortions has been stayed by the courts, but it will go to your state uh, Supreme Court, which is uh, inhabited by Republicans. So I don't have a whole lot of hope there. Uh, what are you going to do for women, Miss um, Freed, and how are you going to help us control our own bodies? <laughs> well, You're thank you, Sally, for that question. Um, you know, when we first saw the leak from the Supreme Court, that was a, a punch to the gut uh, of what a fundamental shift of how we view reproductive health care and, and how we view just the, the foundation of the right to privacy. And then when we saw the actual opinion, it was a gut wrenching in the same respect and, and even more so. And so I need to make this very crystal clear that I have always been a champion of a rights of a woman to make her own healthcare decisions. And I will defend those rights of doctors to provide that care. I have now for the last few months been to more, you know, uh, rights protests and rallies and, and defending you know, the women that are on the ground and recognizing that I'm standing on the shoulders of so many women that came before me and knowing that it is my obligation now to make sure that the next generation behind me has the same rights that, that my generation had. And so let me be clear that I'm gonna do everything I can to make sure that we're having those protections here in the state of Florida. And, and you're absolutely 100% correct. I have no faith that this Supreme Court um, is going to respect that right to privacy, even though- How are you gonna change it? How so, are you gonna change it? So here, here's a couple of things that we're gonna have to do. First and foremost, day one, we have a state of emergency um, and I'm governor. That gives me the opportunity to then say, we are not going to send resources down to our state attorneys or to any of our prosecutors who may be going after any of our healthcare providers for providing those resources to be able to utilize in the interim resources that if a woman has to travel outside the state, that we are using our healthcare system to make sure that those resources are available. Two, you will have the full weight of the governor's office to push forth an actual constitutional amendment that is going to expand that right to privacy, which will be overturned. And unfortunately, my primary opponent put half of those justices, or at least the, the chief justice, in there. Um, that is going to be part of the overturning of our right to privacy. So utilize the full weight of the governor's office to be putting forth a new constitutional amendment that is, in fact, going to protect that right to privacy. And then I will be campaigning on it, helping to get signatures, helping to get resources to make sure that it is on the ballot. The last thing is the fact of the matter is when you cut off the head of a snake, the snake dies. When you cut off Ron DeSantis from this conversation, you allow the, the moderate Republicans that are still here, I promise you that they are still here, to be able to work with them to adjust. Because now what you're going to have is potentially seven months of empirical data to show what is actually happening on the ground. It's not this fictitious thing that this is gonna happen. You're gonna hear about back alley abortions. You're gonna hear about women having to go to other states. Unfortunately, we may lose lives in, in the interim and be able to go back to legislatures if this, this is what you wanted. Obviously your rhetoric and obviously your legislation that you have been, been focusing on didn't work because I'm here. And so to recognize that they have an obligation to listen to their constituents and to start making changes. I have three step prongs, executive power, expanding the constitution, and then working with the legislature, or if at the end of the day, forcing the legislature at special session after special session after special session that they will spend in Tallahassee with me until they recognize that they need to do a reversal on, on this piece of legislation. Well, I don't vote in Florida, unfortunately, but I would support that very much. Thank you very much. Thank you. All right, our next question is from the Environmental and Climate Crisis Council. Uh, the chair, Dana Freeling, can't be with us today because she's in Florida and they had a blackout, so she has no internet. Um, but her question is- she's, she's in Texas, Angela. Ah, Texas, sorry. <laughs> Texas, yes, my bad. With, with their um, famous electric grid. Yes, their they're terrible <laughs> electric grid. Uh, her question is, 
Florida has been described as ground zero for climate change in the US, experiencing sea level rise along low elevation <coughs> ocean fronts, where a majority of the population and the economy is concentrated. Um, what, do, what can Democrats do in Florida to better combat climate change, transition to renewable energy, and address fundamental environmental justice issues? Well, first of all, I, I'm very honored that over the course of the weekend, I received the endorsement from the Democratic Environmental Caucus, uh, and as well as the immediate past chair of the caucus. And you're absolutely right. Um, Florida is ground zero. And, and I like to not call it climate crisis. I like to actually call it climate rescue. Because when you talk about rescue, that means that we have a plan, a, a plan to, to work forward and, and to get behind this. Um, and so instead of just ignoring what's happening um, in our environment, our government needs to embrace this and needs to come up with a plan. And that's exactly actually what I've been doing as commissioner of agriculture. We have the Office of Energy. And when I first came in as commissioner, I sat down with our director and I said, your handcuffs are off. Put together a plan of what Florida needs to be doing to move the state forward on energy efficiency, on climate efficiency. And so we came up with a 72 page plan um, and then hosted now a two energy and environment um, summits that invited people from across the country to come together. And then since that 72 page plan, we have then taken pieces of it and try to get it through the legislature. Of course, uh, because I'm a Democrat, it didn't move um, and didn't have the power to force it. But some of the things that we need to be focusing on, we need to be also updating our um, building codes. We need to be expanding our power grids. Um, we need clean energy vehicles in our state. And what we've been doing also in the Department of Energy, uh, we have been able to actually help create that roadmap um, across our state for electric vehicles and figuring out where the charging stations need to be located in our state. We also need to recognize, again, as you already know, that no state in the union is more susceptible to the effects of our climate situation than here in Florida. Um, we've already felt those impacts of extreme weather events. Um, I grew up in Miami and when Hurricane Andrew hit us, everybody thought that was a once in a lifetime storm. But yet every single hurricane season, we're seeing that type of storm threaten our coast um, and, and same type of large and, and, and intensity. Um, and so we know that those, those are happening. And although that the, the climate change represents a real danger, it is also an opportunity to generate jobs um, through innovative technologies and cutting edge energy efficiency efforts. Uh, we will also focus on advanced energy sectors and work with our unions and our industry leaders to, to really train workers to make sure that they're ready for these new green jobs. Um, we're gonna work with our leaders at the federal and local level um, to support the, these disasters, to make sure we're preparing our communities for the times of changes. We, in fact, when uh, President Biden became, got into the White House, we sent him a 30-page plan um, with 40 different issues and, and climate and working together on some of the things that we could be doing from both the USDA side of things um, with carbon sequestration um, to even looking at uh, climate and uh, equities that we know that our minority communities are seeing almost a 200% increase um, in their electric bills than the rest of, of the state of Florida because they don't have the resources to get better lighting, to get better appliances, to make sure there's insulation. So we put out um, a study and then got grant dollars from USDA to start going to some of these communities that, have, that are the most disadvantaged. Um, our sewage pipe uh, infiltration, infiltration um, as well as fertilizer runoff, our harmful algae blooms and cause millions of dollars of damage and loss um, to businesses along the coast. As governor, um, I will establish a clean air and water development fund. Um, this way that we can take these dollars and put it to some of our, our communities and our counties and our cities that may not have some of those resources to, to be able to make some of these changes. My administration will also work with leaders in the EPA and the USDA um, and across our state to really set aside these, these funds. I will increase tax incentives um, for residents who are utilizing water saving um, and Florida friendly landscaping. Uh, these landscapes have helped to avoid some of that runoff that the excess fertilizer and pesticides. Um, I know I was doing my part inside the Department of Agriculture to revamp our best map management protocols to make sure there was a better, um, like better balancing act between the environment and agriculture. We need to make the same thing happen at the local level and on the residential side of things. Um, it's no secret that those affected most by these dangerous toxins in our environment are those, again, that are, that are dis disadvantaged and traditionally. Um, so I will direct the Florida Department of Environmental Protection uh, to define aggressive mitigation protocols to address some of these dangerous chemicals and toxins like those found in the gypstacks 
Um, I'm sure some of you saw what happened at Piney Point uh, two years ago, and that 200 million gallons of toxic water um, dumping into the Tampa Bay area and setting aside aggressive timetables and benchmarks for mediation. Um, including in these plans is detailed communications efforts to work with our neighboring neighborhoods to, to levels to make sure we're identifying um, opportunities for citizens to be participants in some of these programs. Um, I will also be attainable but aggressive uh, renewable energy targets in our electric utilities. Uh, about three months ago, uh, I stood with some of our, our kids um, and declared that we are going to get to by 2050 um, complete renewables. I only have the power inside the Department of Agriculture to set goals. I have no power right now to actually enforce them. That comes with the governor's office. Um, my administration will work with our, our, you know, giving targeted tax credits towards solar, um, as well as other forms of energy efficiency. Florida would no longer um, ignore solar. We will streamline the adoption of solar, creating new jobs along with clean energy. Restoring the Everglades also not negotiable. Uh, the Everglades are the beating heart of our state. It is one of the most uh, treasured, not just here in our state, our country and, and the world. And it is essential to our environment and to our soul of, of who we are as Floridians. I will immediately implement an aggressive Everglades restoration plan to ensure that we are doubling down on our efforts to restore the Everglades. Um, I also wanna halt um, the continued pollution from Lake Okeechobee, into Lake Okeechobee. Thank you very much. Our next question will come from Lee Donald Moore. He's the chair of the Global Black Caucus. Yes, thank you very much, Angela. And on behalf of the Global Black Caucus, we are truly grateful and appreciate the hard work and efforts you do on a daily basis, and also your efforts in incorporating the Creole language and community, making politics, uh, politics accessible to all. Um, speaking about our future, which lies solely in our children and, and, and is dependent on the decisions that we make today. Um, critical race theory has been in use by conservatives to criticize how race is being taught in the K-12 education system. Most public school officials across the country don't teach the theory, even in districts where lawmakers are seeking to ban it. DeSantis, along with state Republicans and some parents, claims that lessons founded in critical race theory are still being taught in Florida schools, despite the state prohibition, a notion denied by school leaders. So what will you do to uphold education of the real history of the United States? Thank you very much. Thank you so much for that question. Um, this is, we're seeing this be played out in real time right now um, in our state as we are seeing, first of all, my mom was a teacher for 25 years. Um, my stepsister is a teacher. I'm a product of our public education system. So education is critical um, to every aspect of, of my life. And, and, I, and I am thankful for this question because, you know, I was, my, my niece was turned 13 in March and she, we asked her what she wanted to do for her birthday. And she said, I want to go to Washington, D.C. with Auntie Nikki. And so I took her to Washington, D.C. And, and as we were touring the Capitol, there's a part in the Capitol where there's a video um, about the building of the Capitol. And I was sitting with my niece and my nephew who was a few years younger and they were talking about how the, the Capitol was built. It was built by slaves. And as I'm sitting there, my, my, my stomach turned and said, oh my God, are they gonna be able to be taught this in Florida schools? And, and, and my head exploded to, to hear that and the thought that that was not going to happen. And, and then even hearing um, from so many of our teachers that have now gone through some of those courses that are talking about history and, and civics lessons. And they're saying that the only things that they could talk about when it comes to slavery is that this is an extension of British rule and that eventually the founding fathers just thought it was gonna go away. Hard stop. What? how is that even like a concept that we're talking about in 2022, that we are literally whitewashing American history. And if we don't teach history, it is going to repeat itself. And we have seen an increase of, of again, racism and anti-Semitism in, in our, our state, in our nation and hate crimes. And the only way that we can overcome this is by educating. And by making sure that we are teaching diversity and that we are teaching acceptance. And so first and foremost, the commissioner of education, he's out. New board of education. And in fact, part of one of the things that I would also do as governor, because look, the governor did this already um, on the flip side of things, is that if anybody, any teacher 
is fired. It is criticized. It is let go or are or, or, or told that they can't be who they are in the classroom and can't teach what they need to teach. That school board will receive less funding um, because that is not acceptable in 2022. It's never acceptable. Um, that these are our bullying actions by our governor. And even when we are talking about the, the don't say gay bill, um, I was with a group of people yesterday from the Human Rights Council of Palm Beach County who also endorsed me yesterday and talking about one of the women there who's um, has, uh, she's in a, a same sex marriage and talking about can her kids bring their pictures of their family into the classroom? That we have teachers that can't have pictures of their of their spouses in there, um, and we have seen that for the last three years um, that I have been fighting to hold the governor and the commissioner of education um, accountable. I was the one when the second that the governor started to threaten our superintendents and started to threaten our school boards that I called the White House immediately to make sure that they would get our backs, that I stood there side by side with our teachers and with our school board members, and that we have taken a dangerous step backwards um, that I intend to make sure that we reverse course um, because this is doing such a disservice to our state, to our children, to the future of, of our, our country. If we are not teaching history, which I think is their point, then we are gonna go backwards and not forward. Um, I will allow for, for challenging, you know, conversations and, but that goes, you know, we've got to make sure that we are teaching our students and we are <coughs> making sure that our kids are, are thinking through diversity and, and how we're expanding um, that intellectual base, because look, our state is one of the most diverse in, in the country. And, and if we're not teaching our kids, um, what are we doing here? That is the foundation of who we are. And uh, that is something that if you hear my passion about, um, we will be reversing course immediately once I'm governor. All right, um, our next question, and we're kind of running out of time, but we have two more questions. Our next question is from Bob Vallier. He's the chair of our LGBTQ caucus, Bob. Sure, hi. You can probably guess what I'm gonna ask about, <laughs> but I'm gonna preface it with, two assumptions. First, assuming you are elected. And second, assuming also that you do not have a majority in the state legislature. What will you do about the don't say gay law? You've already talked about what it means um, mm -hmm. for people, um, families. Um, uh, what are you going to do uh, to undo it? And in addition, how will you protect the rights of the LGBT community going forward? What concrete steps will you take to make sure that members of our community are fully protected under the law and have equal rights and equal opportunity? Well, thank you, Bob, for that question. Uh, this one's personal, this one's family. Um, my stepbrother came out to me when we were in high school. And ever since that moment, I have been in the trenches. Um, going to, at the time, everybody says we have gay pride parades today, that's because there was gay marches and rights um, protests back when I was you know, growing up. And, and so I have been that advocate. Even I was student body president at the University of Florida and I had the first ever cabinet position for the gay student union and making sure that I actually was reminded the other day that there was a, a radio station at UF that refused to advertise for Pride Month. I said, well, if that's the case, you were getting no funding from any of our student organizations and, and made sure, and that was back in 2002. Um, I have been in those trenches. And when I became commissioner, the first action I took was expanding um, our discrimination clause to make sure that everybody was included. Um, the second action was I hired um, the first ever LGBTQ advocate in the state of Florida. And now we're on, um, <clears throat> Nick Harris was my first, excuse me, was my first advocate. And now uh, Nathan Brummer, who is a member of the trans community is number two. And so I have always been that voice and that is part of who I am. So when it comes to this atrocious discriminatory piece of legislation, first off, I have no doubt, no matter how conservative this court is, that they're gonna have to, to overturn this because it is so vague, it, it is so broad that there's no way to actually interpret this in a way that has that, that people can have consistency and interpretation of it. And as governor, um, and this is what I did even as commissioner on, on a piece of, and a, a 
uh, lawsuit that was happening that the commissioner's office was named in that I didn't agree with is dealing with home rule issues when it comes to guns, that I flip sides and put the weight of the commissioner's office with the plaintiffs instead of with the defendants. And so having the ability to then flip sides to make sure that the governor's office is on the side of equity and equality, um, making sure that we are part of the argument to strike down this law as unconstitutional. And I will use the executive authority to make sure that we are protecting <clears throat> our kids and making sure we're protecting our teachers because it goes on both sides. It's making sure that our kids feel safe to making sure that they're not discriminated in, in the classroom and to make sure that the teachers feel the same thing. Like I was just saying, I'm hearing from teachers who can't put their spouse pictures in their in their office and in their classroom. And if they dare have rainbow um, lanyards, that they got to take those off. And that even when the Department of Education um, last year took down off of the Department of Education's website resources for our kids in the LGBTQ plus community, we put it up on our website. Um, so I take all of that passion all of those things that I've already done as commissioner and I take it to the governor's office and not only expanding that, but creating a separate agency that is purely focused on LGBTQ issues and being out an advocate and creating a cabinet, kind of like I think President Obama did in, in, when he was president, but doing that same thing inside the governor's office. And of course, expanding our anti-discrimination clause um, and teaching diversity and inclusion, um, making sure that we're reversing course on a lot of that. And that doesn't take legislative issues. <laughs> hey, let's, we have our one last question and it is from our youth caucus. Um, Alicia, can you unmute and ask, ask your question, please? Yes, hi. Um, thank you for being here with us today. Um, so the youth caucus question will carry off your response to Dana's question. And I just love how you call this topic climate rescue. So the beaches of Florida attract millions of tourists and billions of dollars every year. The beaches are subject to critical erosion, which threatens the beaches development, recreational, cultural and environmental value and poses a threat to Florida's well-being. This coupled with rising sea levels um, puts thousands of properties at risk, um, as well as having people, forcing people to relocate. So you discussed how us as a party can rescue the climate overall, but if you are elected as the next governor, what measures would you enact to specifically protect your state's beaches, including an elaboration on your Everglades restoration plan? Yep. Well, thank you. <clears throat> Sorry, I'm losing my voice talking too much these days. <clears throat> well, thank you for that question. And I love how we're already changing the narrative, climate rescue. Um, so, so thank you for, for that. And, and look, you know, last two weeks ago was the one year anniversary of Surfside and where we lost um, over 90 individuals. And, and let's call it for what it is. That was a failure from government um, that we didn't look at hardening our, our shorelines that the infrastructure of uh, Surfside of that building was damaged because of saltwater intrusion. And you saw the buildings collapse. And so if we didn't see that as a wake up call, I don't know what else it's gonna take. Um, and so as governor, you know, we need to make sure that, that we've got the clean air and we've got the pristine waterways and, and, our, and they're more than just central to our economy and well-being. Our environment is what makes us special. That's why people come here and travel here. They wanna see our beaches. Um, and, and right now, a quarter of the state's beaches require sand replenishment. I was you know, growing up in Miami and then living in Broward County for 10 years prior to moving to Tallahassee. Um, I saw it. I saw how the local governments were trying to do whatever they could to, to replenish the beaches. And, and, and just putting sand out there is not enough. Um, I have been able to really talk to a lot of environmentalists, a lot of scientists, a lot of inventors of ideas that can really help us when it comes to you know, replenishing our, our beaches and our coastlines, um, dealing with the saltwater intrusion, making sure that we're tackling some of these issues. This is expensive for sure, but we don't have a choice. We have to invest because if we don't do it now and start the ball rolling in 10, 20 years, 
we're not going to have the beaches. We're not going to have the coastal communities. You want to talk about, you know, something else is another hit that 30 year mortgage goes away because the, the, in 30 years, those properties may not be here. And, and so while Florida does have regulations to protect our, our natural shorelines, um, they're filled with tremendously large loopholes. I will close those loopholes. Um, for example, you know, the private interest that can override our, our beach preservation, you know, expansion exemptions are provided for single family homes to develop seawall seaward of more than of more than 30 year ex erosion project line. This isn't sustainable and everybody knows that. You know, so we've got to take a really serious look at what is happening on the coastal communities, making sure that we're utilizing the resources that are coming down from the federal government, that the, a lot of the money that came, is going to be coming down from the infrastructure bill is going to have to be used to hardening our shores and to making sure that we're looking at what's happening. And, and again, to the climate rescue plan, that also is going to virtually help to make sure that we're mitigating the, the sea level rise. And the other issue is that we're seeing it too, just if you drive around anywhere in South Florida, anytime it rains, it floods. And, and unless you are in a more affluent community that can afford to, to raise um, the, the, the roadways, you're stuck in a situation that really is gonna hinder people's ability to further property values or even just to move around the state. Um, and so I will be that champion of our beaches. Again, growing up in Miami, it was um, something that I frequented uh, almost every other week growing up. Um, it is what makes Florida incredible. Um, it's something that we haven't seen and done ever. You know, we had a previous governor who wouldn't even say the word climate change. And, and so we have been really behind the eight ball on this. We have been doing everything we can inside the Department of Agriculture to be a voice and to be part of this conversation. But as governor, um, this is a concrete um, effort that needs to get done. And we need to make sure again on the Everglades restoration plan that we're utilizing our resources from the state and the federal <clears throat> to make sure that we are protecting our Everglades. Um, when you talk to any of our Native Americans, their DNA is literally in the Everglades. This is the fabric of our state. We have got to be making sure that we're educating our, our members of Congress, make sure we're educating our state officials and our local officials so they recognize how important it is. And most importantly, stop development. I mean, now I have been on the forefront of two major issues on, on dealing with how we're going to protect the Everglades. There was a plan down in Miami-Dade to expand one of the highways that was going to basically come right on, on the cusp of the Everglades. And when you expand our roadway, you know what comes next, development. It went against um, the entire Miami-Dade um, <clears throat> development plan. Uh, there was a, an appeal that came to the Board of Trustees, which is the, which is the, um, the cabinet. And I was the only vote that upheld the administrative judge's rulings saying that this was outside of the purview of the zoning plan. And including, um, I have testified in Miami-Dade a few of the last month on dealing with another development project that was going to hurt the Everglades. Um, so that's what it's gonna take, it's gonna take bold leadership, prevent some of this development out in the Everglades, not only because it gets rid of the waterway, but also will increase the pollution into the Everglades. So you need concrete leadership with a concrete plan. <clears throat> Thank you. Thank you very much. Um, Commissioner Freed, do you have a moment to take one more question from the audience? Sure. Um, okay. Um, Fantastic. I've got it uh, teed up here. Thank you. Go ahead. Angela. So Suzanne Jeffries would like to know what your position is on charter and magnet schools and public school funding. Yes. So as again, a product of our public school system, um, my stepsister is still teaching in the Miami-Dade public system. My mom was a teacher. Um, what we have seen is this expansion of our schools of choice. And, and, and so the cat is out of the bag. We can't pull it back in, but we need to make sure that we are not hurting our traditional schools in the same breath. We all voted for having the lottery as part of, of how to fund education. And what the Republicans have done, they've played this little shell game. And they've used the lottery money, but they've taken all this other money out. Um, I represented Broward School Board for eight years before running for office. And I was in those trenches, making sure that there wasn't money that was taken out of traditional schools, um, dealing whether it was PICO funding or, or resources, trying to encourage that if we're going to have charter schools, that they're going to have the same type of standards, both on building standards, educational standards, of that of the traditional schools, or they shouldn't be allowed to get resources. 
Um, but my commitment to our public education system is that we have to double the per pupil funding. We right now are 49th in the nation when it comes to funding of our education system, yet we're the third largest GDP in the country and sometimes larger than, and than other countries around the world. And so if we are not dedicating the resources, not only are our kids going into failing schools, we are not retaining our teachers, um, we are not in, 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 you know, recruiting more teachers into the, into the system. Um, so in 2006, per pupil funding was roughly about 6,400. It is now at 6,900. It should be over 10,000 just with inflation. I'm not even talking about inflation now. I'm just talking about general inflation. So per pupil funding must be doubled within the four years of my administration. That way we can pay our teachers better. We can make sure that the infrastructure around our kids is not failing, that we're not seeing leaking coming out of, of the air conditionings, that, <clears throat> that their tables are not rocking, that their not, books are not falling apart, that we've got technology in our classrooms. Um, but it is important that we recognize um, that we are failing our kids by not having an adequate education system um, because unfortunately we know that a third and third grade reading is where the legislature decides how many jails and prisons to build. And if 90% of our black children are reading below the poverty line in third grade, we are severely hurting them and the future of our state. So we need to be focusing on ways that we are going to increase um, our educational standards, making sure that we're providing resources to these communities, and that comes with a commitment to double per pupil funding. Okay, well, thank you so much, Commissioner Freed. Uh, thank you for your time. And uh, I wanna, if we can put out the link for her website one more time, that would be really great. Um, we wish you the best of luck. And uh, I guess we may or may not see you in the future. So thank you so much. <laughs> well, and thank you all uh, truly for, for this time today. And thank you for staying involved in the political process, um, being so far away. Uh, it shows that uh, democracy um, expands past our borders and, and you help to keep that going here. And I promise you, I am our fierce fighter for democracy. Um, and I saw one of the chats in there. I know we're out of time, but beating Ron DeSantis, I'm our only shot. Um, I know how to take tackle him. I know how to take him on. I know how to not just throw punches, but how to land the punches. Um, if we are going to take down DeSantis, restore democracy in Florida, and make sure we're protecting across the country, I hope that I have your vote in August, and, and then we are off to uh, taking him down in November. So thank you for all that you all do. Yes, thank you. Thank you. Take care. All right. Our, our next guest, uh, Representative Charlie Crist is here. Uh, Representative Crist, can you unmute and turn on your camera? Hello. I will. Am I unmuted? Yes, you're Great. unmuted. Go right ahead. Hi. How are you? Let me, we're going to have a brief introduction. Can you please introduce him, Diane? Yeah. Hi, everyone. I'm Diane Daniel, speaking from the Netherlands. I'm pleased to introduce you to Charlie Christ, who happens to be my U.S. representative in the 13th <clears throat> Congressional District based in St. Pete, where he also grew up. He's been in that role since 2017. If you've lived in Florida for long, you already know his name. Charlie started his political career in the Florida Senate from 1993 to 1999. And over his career, he's also served as commissioner of education, attorney general, and as governor from 2007 to 11. So instead of me summarizing what he hopes to achieve as governor, I'll let him tell you, take it away, Charlie. Thank you. Great, thank you. Thank you so much. It's uh, great to be able to be with you all today. Uh, appreciate the opportunity. You said you're in the Netherlands, is that right? And I'm also I'm also voting your district. So yes, I heard that. Thank you. Yeah. That's wonderful. Well, listen, I think things are pretty obvious. What's going on? We've got a governor who is out of touch, uh, who is as hard right as anybody I've ever seen in my career. Uh, it is apparent to me that he's running for president of the United States, and he's trying to carve out a very conservative, hard right record uh, that he's already done. Uh, in order to try to capture that Republican nomination in 2024, and he's forgetting about Florida in 22. 
you know, it, it's almost as though, as I describe it on the trail, that he goes to bed every night thinking about what group he can bash the next day, whether it's LGBTQ kids, whether it's women and the right to choose, whether it's African Americans and their right to have uh, congressional districts. Uh, he virtually unilaterally redlined out Al Lawson's congressional seat, Val Deming's congressional seat. Thank goodness she's going to be our United States Senator. Uh, but it's one thing after another with this guy. And, and I think he's really uh, overreached on what he's doing. Uh, two polls in the past two weeks have us beating him either by one point or a point and a half. In the primary, we're ahead by 21 points and we've outraced our opponent three to one. Uh, I feel very good about where we are, uh, but your support is very important to me. Uh, and that's why I'm privileged to have the opportunity to be with you today. Um, the things that I think are important to Floridians are number one, fundamental fairness. Uh, this guy, DeSantis, is the opposite of being fair. And as I just outlined with several groups, uh, that's what he does every single day. Um, now, what I think is also extremely important to Floridians, because I travel the state every day. I'm in Washington today. Uh, I'm going to Jacksonville tonight. I'll be in Orlando later tomorrow and, and then back to Tampa Bay. Uh, and of course, Tampa this weekend, we have a, a Florida Blue Convention in Tampa uh, this weekend I'm looking forward to. But Florida is unaffordable. I mean, if you're a millionaire or a billionaire like Ron DeSantis friends, you're doing fine. If you're not, like most Floridians, you're getting squeezed and it's terrible. Uh, let's look at housing first. Uh, in the housing market, um, we are the most expensive state to live in in America today, according to Forbes. About three weeks ago, they did a piece more expensive than California, more expensive than New York, uh, and the governor's doing nothing about it. So in the area of housing, they've raided the Sadowski Fund and the state budget, which is designed specifically to be able to have Floridians put a roof over their head. It applies to both sales and rentals. Uh, and as I say, they've gutted it. They've also passed legislation to keep it cut in half for eternity. Uh, it's unconscionable. Uh, what I think we need to do is restore the funds in the Sadowski Trust Fund and work with our federal friends. I'm in Congress now. One of my former colleagues in the House of Representatives is now Secretary at HUD, Housing and Urban Development, Marsha Fudge. Great person. She just came to Florida last week, so she's familiar with how challenging it is for Floridians to rent an apartment, to buy a home. Uh, it's next to impossible. But to have her come down, work with her, and instead of the current governor who bashes the Biden administration every day, we will, of course, work with the Biden administration and hopefully get additional support for our fellow Floridians in their housing crisis. In addition, we can work at the local level. I have a great mayor, Ken Welch, first African-American mayor of St. Petersburg, and I'm very proud of that. He's laid down almost $70 million already for housing just in the city of St. Petersburg. And of course, we have four, over 400 cities across the state. So I think you work at the state, uh, the federal level, the local level, do everything you can to cooperate and work together, which is my style anyway. I wanna work with people to do what's right for the people of our state. Uh, gas prices, through the roof, it's crazy. So last November, I proposed to the governor, DeSantis, that he eliminate the state gas tax. Of course, he ignored it, uh, didn't do anything about it. The prices kept going up and up and up. And if we're able to have done that with the federal government, we could have cut the price of gas almost 50 cents a gallon. That would have made a difference to folks. It would still make a difference today. But what he did in the legislative session is say, okay, we're gonna give you a break, but we're only gonna do it for one month. And guess what? You know what month it is? It's gonna be October, right before the election. I mean, how stupid does he think we are? Uh, apparently he thinks we're not too smart, uh, but I know Floridians are smart. That's why it should have been done already. They need relief now. They needed it months ago. He wouldn't respond to them. So when it comes to housing, when it comes to the price of gas, nothing. How about property insurance? Talking to your friends back in Florida, I'm sure you're hearing the, the problem that property insurance is going up and up and up. Well, the governor called a special session a few weeks ago. They didn't do anything to lower rates. All they did, in fact, was make it harder for consumers, Florida consumers, to go after their insurance companies and at least get the payment they deserve uh, when they have something that property insurance should cover. So he has struck out on all three of these issues that are pocketbook issues, kitchen table issues, that Floridians are dealing with every single day, whether they're Republican, Democrat, or independent. They're all frustrated. 
these are the kinds of things that I want to approach. These are the kind of things that a governor needs to attack. We need to improve our education system in the Sunshine State. Remember, I'm a former commissioner of education. I'm a product of our public school system. Um, I'm two of my three sisters were public school teachers. We need to properly fund our education system in the Sunshine State. We are now the third largest state in America, and we're funding our teachers at 49th out of 50. That's embarrassing. It's unconscionable, and it's got to stop. Uh, I'm very proud. I just got the endorsement from the Florida Education Association, from the American Federation of Teachers. In fact, I'm the only candidate in this race who's gotten union support and endorsements. Uh, I'm very proud of that, and it's going to make a big difference in the campaign. AFL-CIO, SEIU. Uh, you go down the list, they've been kind and, and endorsed us, uh, all of them. So I feel good about where we are. I know we need to beat this guy. And I'm the only candidate who can. I've actually been your governor before. I've actually vetoed anti-abortion legislation before. I'm solid on these issues. I'm pro-choice. I am for women. I am anti-discrimination. I am pro-public education. I fight for the environment do everything I can to make sure that these things are done because I know that's where Floridians are. That's where most people in the Sunshine State are. They want a safe community to raise their family. They want good schools to send our children to, want to make sure that we have a clean environment so we protect our tourist industry. I'm running against an anti-business incumbent. He's against Walt Disney World for crying out loud. It's unbelievable. And earlier last year, he sued Florida's cruise industry. So we need somebody who's focused on getting good paying jobs, keeping them in the sunshine state, not scaring them out uh, and having culture wars against LGBTQ, against women, against minorities, uh, you name it. And who will stand up for Florida and do the right thing and lead with a decent heart and be a good governor who cares about people and understand who the boss is, it's you. This guy thinks he's the boss. He's a, an authoritarian who would like to be a dictator. I'm a Democrat who's running to fight for democracy. And I seek your support. I appreciate the time to be with you. Thank you so much for your kind introduction. Uh, Representative Christ, um, I know you had some time constraints. Can you stay for a few moments and take a couple questions? Uh, I have one minute till I meet with Jamie Harrison, our chairman of the Democratic National Committee. So a uh, couple okay. of questions, we can do a lightning round. That'd be great. Okay, uh, our first question comes from our <clears throat> Global Women's Caucus, uh, Sally Swartz. Can you please uh, unmute and ask your question? Thank you, Angela, and hello, uh, Charlie Chris. I noticed Hi, that you put women at the bottom of the uh, list of all the things that are wrong with Florida. Now, I know there are a lot of things wrong with Florida, but uh, why don't you tell us why we should vote for a male, stale, and pale candidate for governor? Thank you. Because I'm the only candidate running for governor this year that's actually already vetoed an anti-abortion bill. I'm the one. Well, that what are you going to do about it now that um, it's too late? I don't think it's too late. I don't ever give up. And, and okay, I, what are you going to do? If, if you'll let me speak, Sally, I'd be happy to try to answer. Go for it. Okay, thank you so much. What I think what I want to do is the day I get sworn in as your governor, I'm going to sign an executive order restoring a woman's right to choose. I'm gonna take it to court if I have to and make sure that we fight and get a good result uh, in the court system. As your former attorney general, I know how to do it. In addition, I'll even work with this legislature if I have to. I know that there are moderate Republicans, Sally, that feel suppressed right now under this governor's leadership because he's an authoritarian, as I said before. I was raised with three sisters. I go back as a champion for women's rights to when I was a young state senator in 1995 on the health care committee, as a Republican, I voted and killed legislation that would have gone to the Senate floor and probably passed, that would have required a 24-hour waiting period. The bill that I vetoed is your governor, and I'll do it again if I have to. And it looks like I might have to, and I'm happy to do it. What's going to require an ultrasound and make women pay for the ultrasound too. Even as a Republican, I vetoed it you will not find a better advocate for women's rights than Charlie Crist. Uh, Congressman, you. tell Jamie you're with Dems Abroad, he'll understand. <laughs> I'll let him know. <clears throat> yeah, Thank he you. knows us very well. Uh, we'll take one last question from our Seniors Caucus. Uh, Jim Dobson, do you wanna ask your question? Sure thing. Uh, Governor Crist, um, 
can you tell us about uh, the senior bill of rights that you would implement? Or what, what, what protections and rights do you, uh, do you feel are necessary for seniors? Well, my dad's 90 years old, my mother's 87, and I myself am 65. So what I think is what we need to do is protect Social Security, protect Medicare, advocate that to my colleagues here in the Congress now, and I've gotten to know these wonderful people all over the country. So when this is you know, a federal issue, when it comes up, you get a call from somebody that you served six years with in the Congress, then I think you have a better opportunity to advocate for these issues that are so important to each and every one of us. I'm a Social Security recipient. I receive Medicare. I understand how important it is. And I know it's important to all of Florida seniors. But in addition to that, I'd fight for voting rights. My mom and dad love to vote by mail. This governor has made it more difficult for all of us to vote by mail. That's an affront not only to seniors, but to anybody who wants to exercise their right to vote in our democracy. Listen, I served with a great advocate for voting rights in our country, John Lewis, uh, a civil rights champion as well, by the way, God rest his soul. And he used to always tell me and anybody else who would listen in the House of Representatives, he would say, Charlie, your right to vote is precious. In fact, it's so precious, it's probably sacred. This is one of the most important issues facing seniors and all of us in Florida and America because our democracy is under attack. You support me in this election. Give me your vote. I will not let you down and I'll take this guy down. Thank you so much for having me. It's great to be with you, Jim. Thank you. All right. Thank you so much, Representative Chris, for sharing with these Florida voters around the world how you would bring change to our state in a critical time. My pleasure. Great to be with you. Great. See you in St. Pete. Look forward to it. Thank you. Bye Thank now. you, Congressman. Bye. All right. So uh, I'd like to thank everyone who joined us on the call today. Every time we hear from candidates on the ground, I'm so inspired and energized to keep up this work, to get out the vote overseas. And we are so grateful for the tremendous work that they're doing on the ground. So we'll keep up our, our side of the fight and get everybody to go out and request an absentee ballot. Um, if you haven't requested your absentee ballot, there's still time. You can go to votefromabroad.org and our, they must, we can, you can still vote in the primary, but it must, they actually, I got my ballot, I don't know, at least three or four days ago, and they can be sent back by postal mail, courier, or fax. And if you don't have a fax machine, there are ways to send it back uh, by just sending a scanned PDF. But we can, we'll send some information out about that. Um, your ballot has to be received by 7 p.m. on election day, Tuesday, August 23rd. And please refer to our detailed voting guide and ballot access return and return instructions for more information. In closing, I'd like to give a big shout out to all our great volunteers, both on camera and behind the scenes, and a special shout out for Carol Moore, uh, our team lead, uh, who's not wasn't available to come today, but she will definitely be watching this video. And once again, I'd like to thank all our, our participants for taking the time to listen in and make an informed decision about which Democrat you'd like to see in office. Please be sure to share this recording once it's out and we'll send out an email with the link and some other information. And it'll be available on our Facebook page, our Dems Abroad Facebook page, and also our YouTube channel. Please keep in mind that Democrats Abroad is a, an all volunteer run and funded organization and your support goes a long way. A donation of $10 will help us reach at least 20 overseas voters. We also hope you'll consider stepping up to be a volunteer, uh, especially with the Florida team. You can email uh, fl at democratsabroad.org and uh, join our team because we do need help. Uh, Florida has a large number of overseas voters and we need a bigger team to make, to do as much as we can to get out the vote. Um, you you wanna consider joining our Slack channel to get involved, or you can join our Floridians Abroad Facebook group. And you can follow us at, at States Abroad on Twitter. Uh, I'll be ending the recording and then we can- Thank you, Angela.
Thank you. Oh, <laughs> yeah, I'm a Florida voter too. So I'm definitely concerned. <laughs> I'm gonna end the recording and